Hi, everyone. Uh, that last talk was really cool. And um, we're not going to talk about biology or anything so cool. But hopefully, you can, you can empathize with, with my talk a little bit, at least, which is you know, a question that we ask ourselves all the time. Uh, Instacart's core customer is families. And uh, one of the things we joke about, the, the most universal question that every family has is, what's for dinner? And it's, it's like 11 AM right now, so you probably haven't asked yet. But I bet by the time 4 o'clock rolls around, you're asking yourself, like, what's for dinner? And there's a lot of mental labor in that. There's um, how much of my budget do I have left this week? Do I have a sick child at home? Do I have a special occasion? Um, am I trying to eat healthier? Right? There's like a lot of work that goes into that. And we think that generative AI provides a way for us to help answer that question for our customers. This is the core problem that we're trying to solve for our customers. And for 12 years, we've been doing the physical labor of groceries. You, you give us a list of ingredients. We show up at your house an hour later with them. It's magic. Um, but we think that we can do more, and generative AI gives us that opportunity to do that. So I want to talk a little bit today about how we're using that in our current customer experience, the second part of our strategy around internal productivity, and really briefly, on some things that we think are possible future uh, experiences that we can create for customers. So we started a year and a half ago um, at the same place that everyone else did, right? We built a chatbot. And we wanted to answer really meaty questions for people like, what's for dinner? What should I eat? What meal plan uh, can I have? And um, we were building this chatbot. We, we had it in kind of a, a beta for our internal um, employees, and on a, a Friday evening, we accidentally turned it live for a bunch of our customers in July of last year. So we woke up on Saturday, and all of a sudden, there's conversation data streaming in that we did not expect. And we're like, oops, uh, but hey, this is great. We're going to get feedback from customers, and we're going to see what use cases we can solve for them and, and where they're using this. And um, again, we'd, we'd hoped that they would be asking questions like, how can I do meal planning? How can I eat healthier? What they actually asked was like customer support questions. It was like the vast majority was, um, I need to edit my order, or I need to reschedule, or, or things like that. And so we said, OK, well, we're going to listen to our customers. And we retooled the whole product, the chat bot. We turned it into a customer support chat, um, which is really obvious. You know, that's not like, it's so obvious. It's not what we wanted to do, but it's what our customers were asking for. And so we moved it into the customer support side, and we launched it. Um, but we kept paying attention to what customers were asking. And the vast majority of the things that they were asking for help for were things that they could do themselves. This was stuff that was in the UI, right? If you want to cancel an order, edit an order, reschedule, add items, you can do all this yourself. But they couldn't figure out how to do it, or our product wasn't simple enough. For whatever reason, we thought, OK, well, there's some mental labor that we can try and help for customers. So we built something called Action Graph, where our CareBot not only knows the answer to questions that you're going to ask, but it has, action, ac it has access to the actions that it, we can perform on your behalf. And so when a customer comes to the CareBot and they said, hey, I need help rescheduling my order, we don't tell them where to go in the app to do it. We just say, when do you want to like, get your order delivered? And we update it for them. And I think that this is something that customers are going to start to expect. Right? I think in the future, we're going to see companies are going to have an agent. Customers are going to expect to interact with that and that that agent can do things on their behalf. The other place we're using generative AI is in search. So we've done a great job of answering the question like, if you need bread or milk or eggs, we give you a personalized set of responses. We try to get you what you're looking for. But what about things like, I have a you know, soccer game on Saturday for my kids, and I need to provide snacks for 25-year-olds. Like, What do I do? We weren't good at that. And now we were actually able to put generative AI into the search bar. So when you ask us those really complicated questions, we can turn around and give you an answer. And, and the thing that's been interesting here is we, we, like the answer wasn't build a chatbot and put it in the product. The answer was like meet the customer where they are and just put the generative AI kind of into the thing they're already using. And so now we have a place where we can take that mental load off of customers and help them answer those difficult questions um, if, if they want to ask. The third place that we're using generative AI, and, and this is not flashy, right? This is the catalog at Instacart. Uh, we have one of the biggest food catalogs in the world. We have 85,000 stores. We have billions and billions of items. When we started Instacart, that catalog didn't exist. 
And the way that you went and got that catalog is you went to the store and you bought one of every single item and you took it back to your office and you took a picture of it and then you sent that picture off to get edited and then you sent that picture to other humans to go extract attributes and then you put it on the site. And, and we've done this for millions of items at this point. It's a massive amount of work, massive amount of expense to do that. Um, the catalog is kind of the unsung hero of Instacart. No one thinks about it right? But it's 90% of the pixels that are on your screen. If you're lucky, you can sometimes get the manufacturers to help provide data or the retailers. Um, but extracting all of that information, it, there's not a lot of depth to it, right? We're, we're able to do now is use LLMs. There's sort of like a missing magical box in the middle that takes all of this catalog information and extracts attributes. We've had massive impact from extracting things like wine tasting notes or wine pairings or like claims, like does this product claim to be organic? It's not showy, it's not flashy, it's not like the thing you write blog posts about, but it's having a massive impact for our customers. It's increasing sales of wine, for instance, or, or organic products, helping customers find those attributes. And this is an area, area where we've actually partnered with AnyScale. So um, they're powering the infrastructure with the batch VLM um, that is extracting all of these attributes from all these billions of catalogs. Um, and the thing that's really amazing about it is the quality is as good or better than anything else we're doing out there. The results are returning faster, and it's like 10 times cheaper than anything else out there. It's like the last time that was happening when I was a kid and CPUs were getting like better, faster, cheaper. It's just amazing the way things are working, and we're really happy to be partnering with AnyScale to do that. The second part of our strategy at Instacart was really tooled around internal productivity. And so we thought, well, if we can reduce the mental load for our customers, maybe we should try to do that for our team members as well. And this has been something, there's been some interesting like downstream effects from that, which we'll talk about. But we had to have a top-down push. It's hard to change culture. Um, so our CEO kind of came out with a top-down mandate that everyone needs to figure out how to use AI and adopt those toolings to be more effective, to uh, you know, do a, a better job, be more productive at their jobs across the entire company, across the entire, every function. So changing how 3,000 people do their jobs is not easy. It took a lot of effort. Some people are immediately concerned about the long-term impacts of their job. Some people are just really busy. They don't want to learn a new tool, um, like getting developers to switch from VS Code to, to another version of VS Code is really hard. Um, they, they, some people don't know like, how to use the tool. Uh, and so we had to do a lot to democratize the, the use of AI. So we created some tooling internally. Um, this is something called Ava. That is our own version, uh, internal chat GPT client. And we're able to enable this for everyone. But the nice thing, it's got all the privacy concerns like taken care of for, for employees. You don't have to worry about where am I putting my code or where am I putting my work product. Um, we also. Uh, have a prop library in there. So if, if you don't know where to start, you can do a kind of a one-click get started and help me summarize or help me um, write an email. And then it also has access to all of the most recent models, so GPT-4 and Sonnet 3.5. Um, and so employees are able to play with these different things and figure out what's going to work really well for them. We also built Ava right into Slack. So meeting employees kind of where they are. Ava can also sit in on your you know, Google Meets and transcribe the meetings and summarize the uh, action items and the, the summaries and, and provide that to all the attendees of the meeting. It's actually really cool because I think maybe we can get to the point where you don't even know to go to the meeting anymore. Um, but uh, w we also had to do a lot of internal training. So we created something called AI Empowered, which is an internal Slack room where employees were able to share things that they were doing to be more effective at their jobs or um, ways to use AI to give inspiration for others. And so you started to see, as folks shared, other people and other functions would start to adopt these things. We also created learning content that explained, you know, what is generative AI in the first place? Like, what are some ways you can use it? Um, and, and again, it's hard to get a bunch of people to do any one thing, but we started to see this actually pay off. And so now we're at the point where the vast majority of the company is using Ava every single week. And, and that's not even including Copilot or any of these other AI tools that, that, that folks are using. 
And there's been some really interesting downstream effects from this. Everything I talked about earlier, like with Ask Instacart, Chatbot, th those were built by teams that were sort of focused very heavily on AI. What we started to see is when you have employees using AI as part of their daily workflows, they're going to find ways to use AI in the product. And so we've seen it just spread across the company. So now we have shopper teams, customer teams, enterprise teams, like these things that we were pushing for are now spreading naturally because people are a lot more comfortable with it. They're figuring out how to make it, um, how to reduce that mental load for themselves and then how to do that in turn for customers. It's had a couple other interesting effects. So you have to start to make it easy for people to do the right thing. Uh, back to our catalog augmentation example, um, we have billions of items, right? And it would be really easy for an engineer to grab an API key from an AI provider and kind of set up a job over the weekend to iterate and enumerate through each of those billion products one by one, making calls to the LLM. And you can sort of do the math on what that would cost. I know exactly how much it costs. Um, when what they should be doing is using our batch LLM processing. But you have to start to think about um, how do you make it easier to do the right thing? How do you remove that mental load? Another example that we have. So we were doing these small group trainings. Um, we would take our most avid users of Ava across the company and give them access to things like our AI gateway, super blocks, um, tools that they could solve some of their own problems. The person in finance, um, a part of their job is to analyze all of our experiments and um, analyze their impact of profitability, right? It's something that takes hours or even days a week. It's a very manual process. And so he grabbed, uh, you know, AI Gateway and threw a script together. It's literally never coded in their life. Um, and he automated that entire part of his job. So now instead of spending hours gathering all this mental data, clicking between screens and copying them into a spreadsheet, it just dumps it in a spreadsheet and he goes, and it's more of like a spot check now. The thing that's interesting about this though, is like, that's awesome, right? I love that he's spending time doing more strategic things for the company. Uh, but also when we built the AI Gateway, we built it for machine learning engineers. Right? Like the people that are actually using it are machine learning engineers, software engineers, product managers, designers, like 30 people from accounting. Right? Like there's all these people that have started to adopt this tooling. Um, you need to make it easier and, and like the customer that you're serving has changed. You guys are the builders of the AI infrastructure and the AI tooling here. Right? This is, I think, really important. It's something that we've started to invest a lot more heavily in making things available to a broader, a broader customer base. So the, the last thing um, I'll leave you with is just a preview of some things we're thinking about with generative AI. I'm not gonna say that I like, know where the future's headed. I think it's changing so fast. Um, there, there's no way to know. But you can sort of look at the past and think about what are things that like, I personally want. Um, we're working on something called the personalized planogram. And you know, we've got a decade of history in the grocery space, and, and the more we know about a customer, what they like, their preferences, the better job we do at personalization. The, the concept of a personalized planogram, so actually a planogram, for those of you who don't know, is a term that's actually rooted in like a physical retail space. So when you walk into a grocery store, there's like a map, and it's, you know, the planogram is what says that the produce is going to be over here, the milk's going to be over here, the chips are on this aisle and this set of chips is there and this set of chips is on this second shelf and you know it, it, it's like lays out what that store looks like and retailers build this they put a lot of effort this is a special sauce for retailers um, but when you go into that store you're in their planogram right a personal example that i have is like i spend a lot of time looking at nutrition labels i have a three-year-old i want to make sure that he's eating healthy i don't eat certain ingredients i do a lot of mental math to like figure out what's the calories over grams of protein. Is this a product that I want to consume? When I go into the store, I have to like look at the labels and I have to walk around and find the things I'm looking for. I think that that's going to change. I think we're going to be able to build an experience that's really, truly customized to you. And I, I don't mean like personalizing the way we think about it now where uh, 10 years ago, Instacart like looked the same for everyone, right? Today, if you go to Instacart, it's highly personalized to what we know about your preferences, the types of things that you're buying. But the boxes, we're personalizing the content in the boxes, right? The boxes are still the same. I think in the future, we're going to, well, I'm hoping to see that the actual experience, the user interface, is starts to be personalized to you. So 
my version of Instacart may not be what your version of Instacart looks like, but it's going to be very personalized and it's going to be exactly what you're looking for. And it might even change depending if you're doing your weekly shop or if you're just getting a couple of extra ingredients for dinner tonight, or if you're you know, shopping for like a barbecue, a special event on a Saturday. So I'm really excited about that. It's something we're still playing with. Um, you'll start to see these things roll out over the next few months, but um, I think customers are going to start to expect a lot more personalization, a lot more customer, uh, a lot more uh, personalization in, in interfaces over time. So if there's anything I'd leave you with, I think you all know this, but you gotta remember to solve the core problem for your customers. You can't just use AI and bolt things onto it. You need to really make sure that you're doing it using generative AI in a way that's gonna solve that core problem, and it's not always flashy. In the catalog example, it, it's, but it's one of the most effective ways. Investing in productivity across your company has been one of the fastest ways that we found to increase adoption through the product and R&D teams as well, and I think that's, that's probably true. Um, and then finally, the downstream effect of that is you're gonna have to take your tooling a step further than you probably normally do and really make it usable by your whole team. Because if you're doing this right, that's who's going to be using it. So thank you.